You got it locked on Rodeo Radio. Due to circumstances beyond anyone's control, Dr. Dre is in the motherfucking house. So right about now. And I say, yo Steve, are you with me? I C E, are you with me? Here's a little something about a nigga like me that never should have let me buy tape from Steve. Ice Cube would like to play in dope shit mixed by Dr. Dre. Since I was a youth, I like concert. Now I like the motherfucking rodeo. Buying a tape or two, that's what the hell I do. You don't like Tony A, well fuck you, this is a game. And I'm in it. Ice Cube will fuck you up in a minute with a right, left, right, making you sick. And then you see Tony A is on the mix. Tony A. Tony A. When you're ready, go. And welcome back, everyone, to Rodion Radio, episode 264. And before I introduce my very special guest, once again, uh, people have been hitting me up via the inbox on Facebook and via the DM on Instagram. And if you ever want to appear on Rodion Radio, I ask three things. Submit your music to rodionradio at gmail.com. The email should be up on the screen, rodionradio at gmail.com. And submit your music, submit a, a short bio, and submit uh, videos if you have any. Visuals are uh, very important. A bio is very important. I believe every artist should be able to have some type of bio, whether you're shopping for a deal, whether it's a press kit and you're just introducing yourself to promoters. It's always good to have a bio. So I encourage you to do that. Other than that, if you guys have not checked out my past episodes or maybe this is your first time tuning in to Rodion Radio, Feel free to look at our, all of our episodes. We have over 260 episodes. This is episode 264. So other than that, if I have any other announcements, I will announce them uh, before we go to break, during the break, or when we come back from break. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce my very special guest of the day, Dr. David Sanchez, founder and prime minister of the Brown Beret National Party. Thank David, you. How Thank are you? you? Very, very happy to be here. I'm glad you're here, you know, and uh, let me fix my time here. Um, first and foremost, I just want to ask you just a couple of questions, and uh, they may be simple ones. Um, how did you spend your 4th of July? How was your weekend? Oh, it's okay. I, You know, I just went down the neighborhood and hung out with some friends and watched the fireworks. You know, <laughs> It was good. That's good. That's good. Now, you know what? I want to ask you, uh, um, uh, I, I really want to jump right into it because I was sharing with you off camera that since I was a child, I was born in 68. And uh, you had told me that you had formed the, uh, uh, if I'm correct, the Brown Berets in 67. Right. Since I've been a child, I've always heard of the Brown Berets. I just didn't know who they were, what they were, what it stood for. But all I knew that the Brown Berets stood for Rasa, if I'm correct. It was always cloudy. But the beautiful thing is now that I have the man here who started it all before me, so now I get to ask all my questions that I've been wanting to ask since I've been a youth. So my first and foremost question is, where originally are you from? Like, where were you born and raised? I was born, born and raised in South Central Los Angeles, born in California Hospital, downtown Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I grew up around the West Side Flats area. Okay, okay. And... uh your family are they from here as well or yes my my dad's from here my dad was from from macy which is another neighborhood over by uh, overa street that's where my dad's from overa street macy oh okay okay and uh, uh do you have any family that are are from mexico or is, are you guys pretty much my, my grandfather uh okay. my grandfather he's he's from zacatecas mm. uh and uh fresnillo zacatecas mm -hmm. and my grandfather rode with pancho villa Wow. Wow. I, I almost even want to just jump into that right now, but we'll come back to that because I don't know too many people. I don't know if he ever shared with you any stories or maybe your father might have. Oh, shared yeah, some he did. He did. Okay. 
Okay, now do you come from a big family? A lot of brothers, a lot of sisters? Not really. There, I think there was about four or five of us in the family, uh, and we were a pretty pretty tight family. Uh, very supportive. My dad always called himself Chicano, yeah. you know. So of course uh, I picked it up, and uh, it started. You know, the Chicano movement really actually started back during the uh, Zuzu riots. You know, that was a, it was a Chicano Zuzu riots in 1943. Uh, where the Navy men, the, the, the Army men and the sailors were beating up Chicanos downtown, and they, they created a riot, and uh, as a result of it, um, it was a Chicano riot. That was the first Chicano movement, actually, uh, during the Zutsu riots in 1943. How, how long was that Zutsu movement? Because, you know, sometimes, like, we have, like, pe like new wave music, then we have disco music, then we have, like, rap music, and then we have, you know, and it comes and goes. How long was that Zoot Soup movement going on, if you can recall? That's a good point. I think uh, uh, it's a trend, okay? These, what you're talking about is different trends that come about. Correct. The Zoot Soup trend uh, was, uh, lasted a long time because it, it became from, from, from the Pachuco movement, from the Zoot Soup movement. Uh, the Pachuco movement became the, the uh, Cholo movement. And so it did last a, a good 30 years. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, the only thing that I knew growing up about the whole Pachuco movement was from the movie Zoot Suit. Right. That was pretty much how a lot of us Chicanos got our education, pretty much, unless we dug into it and, you know, or spoke to people like yourself. Uh, like yourself. My father is from Torreón, Coahuila, Mexico. His brother, whom was a white guy, but he looked white. We used to call him Chato. That was his, his uh, nickname. And he was a Zoot Suiter. And even in his late 70s, he was still dancing the Zoot Suit style, you know, and he used to play music and dance for us. And we used to trip because we didn't know much about that. And I, as a young teenager, never really sat down like, what was the Pachuco movement? What was the Zoot Suit? It was, it, was, it was a trend, you know, uh, people wanted to identify. A lot of people don't know it, but all the Zoot Suiters and the Zoot Suit riots and all those people from that time, uh, they all went to war as soldiers. Mm. And, all the, and the United States Army, they loved Chicano zoo suiters because they knew how to fight. Mm. And the Chicano uh, won more medals of honor in, in World War II than any other ethnic group. Well, can, can you repeat that again, please, sir? I said the Chicano won more uh, medals of honor uh, than any other ethnic group in the United States. Wow. See, and you're educating us now because... Uh, I truly, not only did I not know, but I'm sure a lot of people out there listening don't know that. A lot of people don't know that just around 20,000 Chicanos died in, in World War II. Wow. So they wanted us. They wanted us in the front line because we knew how to deal with those Germans. You know, we knew how to deal with war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing, one thing that we have to admit that we have a heart. So they throw us in the front lines. Yeah. They throw us in the front But sometimes they, you know, they, they sacrifice us too. You know, they. They say, hey, where's Jose? We need, we didn't, we didn't know where the draw, where the, where the gunfire is coming from. Jose, go out there and show us where the gunfire is coming from. And so, you know, they would use us quite a bit uh, into to send us into traps. Wow. Wow. You know, um, I just have so much going through my mind. So I'm going to slow down because there's so many things that I want to ask you. We'll eventually get to them. If you could share with us, what elementary, junior high, and high school did you attend uh, here in LA? I went to uh, um, John Adams uh, Middle School. Okay. Was, at the time, it was a uh, black and brown school. Uh, it was tough school. It was uh, one of the toughest schools in in the country. As a matter of fact, they made a movie called The Black Boy Jungle, and that was about the school that I went to. Black Boy Jungle? Yeah, The Black Boy Jungle was a movie about the school I went to. Wow. Which is, you know, one of the worst in the country. I mean, it was bad. I, mean, I went to John Adams, and they, I mean, the teachers had handcuffs, and it was just a regular public school, you know, it was really rough. And they would search us all the time. Uh, and all of a sudden, on, on, on the loudspeaker in the PA system, they would say, search! And everybody had to put their hands up. You know, and the whole school, everybody had to put their hands up while the teachers went up and down searching everybody. So it was, you know, it was oppression, you know, genocide. Uh, I, then I went to, uh, I went to Roosevelt High School. And, uh, Roosevelt High yeah. School. Wow. They've been classic football games against Garfield, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Roosevelt. Yeah. It's a good school. Yeah. You know, now, now to, you said something about um, uh, your, your uh, junior high school. 
search and they would search the kids. Do you think they would allow that today? No, no. It was it was a police state. It's still a police state, but not not as much. You know, there's been a lot a lot of school shootings. You know, um, do, do you think because there's been some lately, not only on social media that, that they announced, but also on the news where a lot of people get their news from social media. I always say, wait till you see it on the news. You know, but today it almost seems like social media has become news to this generation. We've been hearing that kids have been taking guns to school. My thing is this. Do you think it would be wrong to bring back some of those rules back to search the kids? Maybe it could prevent lives. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing to bring that back? I think education has to be uh, re-geared, you know, for the Chicano. Uh, the teaching of nonviolence needs to be promoted. Uh, and also the idea of uh, violence prevention needs to be be promoted. With those two, uh, we could solve most of our problems in relationship to to violence. Yes. Uh, the Brown Braves have always been a, a, an emergency organization. When violence gets bad, the Brown Braves, you know, uh, you know, put on our boots and we go out there and we stop it. And we've done that over and over again uh, whenever the violence does get bad. So I understand why. But the Brown Braves have always been like an emergency group and also a civil rights group. So whenever there's an emergency, we go out there and deal with different issues. Okay. Hey, you had mentioned that it was a, a black and brown, pretty much black and Chicano school. Um, was there ever, like today, at least when I went to school in the 80s, high school, blacks and browns were still going at it. What, oh, yeah. Was it the same way then? Yes, yes. For years and years, black, black on brown and brown on black violence has taken a lot of lives. Uh, not too long ago, there was uh, a big fight between blacks and browns over in the Crenshaw district. And I was able to get together with the black leaders uh, and Solis King, uh, the third, and, and the Chicano leaders, and we got together and we put a stop to the violence over on Crenshaw. And that violence that was taking place, 35 people died. Wow. Half of them were rasa. And even kids were getting killed. And so when violence gets out of hand, we, we, we go out there and do something about it. Wow. Okay. Um, g g give us, um, well, you finished high school, you, 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 you finished Roosevelt. Um, what comes next for D uh, Dr. David Sanchez? Did you immediately get a job? Did you start working? Uh, g give us a picture of what was going well, on Well, you in have your to life. understand that most of my life was dedicated, or all my life has been dedicated to social change and justice uh, for the community. Uh, I was at the University of uh, Cal State LA uh, studying and I had to leave the university for a little while, although I went back later on. And, uh, but because it was an emergency, it was a crisis. It's always a crisis during the, the, the movement. I'm talking about when the movement was very, very strong during yes. the 70s. And um, anyway, so I went there and then later on I was able to go to uh, get the BA and then I was able to get, go to graduate school and uh, get the PhD. And then I taught, I taught Chicano studies for uh, 13 years. Wow. Are you still teaching at all? Like I'm teaching in a different. I'm, I'm teaching by action. I'm teaching by Brown Bray education. I'm teaching by Chicano education. I'm teaching by the crisis that's facing us today. All the different the Chicano identity, for example, is a real serious problem in our community. A lot of these people that do violence, they don't have the identity. You know, if they had the Chicano identity, they wouldn't be killing their primos. You know. But the, because the primos are Chicanos, their primos are Mexican Americans, their primos are raza, but still, you know, they get, they get a little crazy and they go out and they kill their own raza. And we've always been on top of that. We've always gone out there and stopped the violence. Yeah, you know, say somebody off the street sees you and just says, hey, man, you know, I saw you on this podcast and you're talking about that we should educate ourselves, we should know who we are, we should know our identity. Why is that important? You know, somebody well, would ask. Because if you don't have one identity, you you fall into multiple identities. And when you fall into multiple identities, that's schizophrenia. Yeah. You know, La Raza, they don't know who they are, you know. And it's a shame. You know, they, they should know who they are. They're, they're Chicanos, they're Mexican Americans, they're Raza, they're brown people, they're, they're of the brown race. You know, but, but a lot of people don't know that. So they, they start taking on other identities. And they want to be Michael Jackson or they want to you know, be this or they want to be that. And, and the same thing, these mass shooters are, are the same. These, these gawachas that go around killing kids in, in the schools, 
they're having, they're going through an identity crisis themselves. The whole country is going through an identity crisis because there is no a national identity in America. The, the national identity in America should be the Indian identity or the Mexican identity because the Mexican identity is also Indian identity. You know, this country doesn't have an ide- a, a culture to, 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 to limits on, you know, uh, violence. Uh, you look at J- Japan. Japan has culture, see, but their culture limits uh, as far as what they can do and what they can't do in relationship to violence. So they don't have violence because they have a culture. We have a culture. And so culture is the foundation of La Raza. That's our strong foundation. That's what makes us strong. Without culture, it's like a, tr- a tree. When a tree uh, falls down from a big wind, it's because it doesn't have roots. And that's where we, we want the tree to stay up and strong by having roots. And roots is our culture. Roots is our history. That's, that's a great analogy of the tree there. Thank you for sharing that. You know, uh, I wanted to ask you just uh, kind of get a, pi- a better picture of your family and how you were raised. What, what did your father used to do, you know, if you don't mind me asking? My father owned a uh, cantina. He, uh, okay. And my uncle had a, a first Chicago nightclub in East LA called the Calypso Inn. And, and then my father had a, a pool hall, which mm. was in downtown Los Angeles. So, so uh, you know, we sold beer for a living. <laughs> That's what my parents did. So anyway... Uh, and my mother never worked. She was she was a good mother, and you know they were they were very strong, very articulate, very communicative. Uh, they were both born here, so they you know they, they prefer using English at home. But when they went, when they wanted to say something that they didn't want me to know, they would speak Spanish to each other. Right. You know, but mostly it was it was it was, it was English in our in our household because they wanted us to go to school, go to college, and and understand uh, becoming um, elaborate in the English language. Right. Do you ever feel, because I have a lot of friends that are like this, like their mom and dad are from Mexico, but when they came over here, they learned English, they had kids here, but they wanted, they, they wanted their son or daughter uh, to, to, be, to have their su primer idioma, like their first language to be English. But later on, they didn't learn, they didn't learn Spanish. When they grew up, they felt a little bit robbed of their culture because they felt like mom and dad, you should have taught us Spanish. Did, did you feel that way at all? No, because I, sp- I have and I still do uh, spend time in Mexico. I, I go And that's where I, I uh, uh, reinforce my Spanish, mm. uh, talking to all the people down there. So, uh, and I, spend, I still spend a lot of time down there in Baja, uh, California. So I think, uh, in my case, it wasn't true. But for a lot of people, I can see that, that it's, there's a need to know both languages. Yes. Because if you know both languages, you can do more things, you know. Absolutely. I just want to touch on a little bit of your, your grandfather. You had shared that, if I'm correct, I heard your, your grandfather knew Pancho Villa? My grandfather fought with Pancho Villa. Fought Pancho Villa. Yeah, okay. and he won a, a medal, a medal, medalla, the Revolucionario. And um, he's, my grandfather, Amado Sanchez, he fought at the Battle for the Hill. It's called the Bufa in Zacatecas. And uh, he was able to knock knock out a, a machine gun nest that the, the Federales were shooting everybody down in the middle of the night, and so he was able to crawl up there alone and knock out the machine gun nest, and he he wow. uh, won a medal for Mexico. Wow, that, wow! I, I've never by the, by the way I've never met anybody that knew or was related to someone that knew Pancho Villa. I've heard a lot of stories, you know, but I've uh, maybe you can shed a little bit of light on this, and and then we'll get back to. Uh, the, the brown beret questions that I want to ask you. There's people that would say good things about Pancho Villa, and then there's uh, people that would say negative things about Pancho Villa. Uh, um, since I never really did my study on it, maybe you can help us out for those that are pretty much ignorant on that subject. Is there negative and positive, or do you know why people would say negative things about him? Well, I think it's it's it's, it's the communication system that we have that we inherited from Mexico. You know, the communication system from Mexico is very chismoso. You know, and, you know, you have a lot of, you know, viejo chismosos and <laughs> vieja chismosas, and they go around spreading rumors about everybody, and that's what was going on during the Mexican Revolution. People right. were spreading a lot of rumors. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a great and, point. And that, and that caused a lot of uh, conflict because, you know, it, you have to remember that they all got killed as a result of t- bad talk about each other. Yeah. Uh, Pancho Villa, uh, he was killed because of a result of bad talk. Zapata, he was killed as a result of bad talk. Uh, 
Francisco Madero, well, he, he was killed as a result of, 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 of uh, a riot that the United States started in Mexico City, and it ended up getting um, Francisco Madero, the president, ended up getting killed. Him and his brother ended up getting killed as a result of people spreading rumors, you know. And so we have to be be careful not to talk bad about people. We have to learn how to talk good about people. Yes. yes. No, very, very true, and I'm glad you brought that up because sad to say that even today, among the Raza, there's still a bunch of chismosos. It's a, it's a problem, and the reason why we have that is because we have a lot of uneducated people out there that want to talk, but they don't know how. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Today, now we have social media where they're bigger chismosos, you know. Uh, um, and I read something today that I don't know how true it is, but it was just saying gossiping women... And again, this is just something I read. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Gossiping women are uh, responsible for 75% of, of deaths because they've opened their mouth and, uh, if you will, said something uh, or accused someone falsely and someone went and took action against against whom she spoke about. It's very true. Uh, 40% of, of all the violence in America, you're talking about 35,000 people get killed every year in the United States, murdered. Of the 35,000 people that get murdered, 40% is a result of arguments. And mm. so that, a lot of that comes from the, from the, from the rumors. Wow. Wow. So, so now, um, if I'm correct, you started this, uh, the Brown Beret Movement in 1967. Now, if I may ask, what motivated, what inspired this for this to come into fruition? Well, I think uh, becoming you know, a victim, I was a victim of violence you know, when I was growing up. Can, can you share that, please? Oh, it's kind of a sad story, but uh, I got I got beat up real bad by a, by a black gang, by the outlaws, you know. And I was just a victim. I was just standing on the corner of my bicycle, and these these blacks came over and and you know knocked me up, beat me up, and you know a police car came and they took me to the hospital. And I was beating up pretty bad. I suffered for about six months because uh, wow. they busted one of my nerves in my face, and so. You know, uh, I think just going through that course of six months of suffering from, from, from being a victim of violence, I think it made me think, you know, hey, this something's got to change, you know. Somebody's got to change this world because if I'm going through this, how many more people are going through this? And it's true, you know. And, for example, in the 90s, it was 1,200 Chicanos killed every year for, for 10 years during the 90s. You know, so how many people are going through all this violent stuff, you know? And also the problem of black and brown, uh, black on brown and brown on black violence, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't have to happen. It can be solved, you know. First of all, the schools need to teach our kids how to talk. Uh, our kids don't know how to talk because the schools don't teach them how to talk, and I think they do that on purpose. Because if people don't know how to talk, they get emotional and they start using violence, you know. So we have to teach our people how to talk. What what year and what how old were you when you got jumped? Uh, I was about 13, 12, 12, 12 years old, yeah. And you were just out somewhere? At yeah, a riding my bike, just just out there on the street on 30, 32nd and Trinity in, in uh, South Central Los Angeles. Now, d during that time, uh, I mean, because I'm, I'm, at times it still happens, Is that was that common? Kind of. Uh, what happened was uh, the blacks at Jefferson High School got in a big fight with, uh, with the Chicanos, and so they just took the fight down into the community and they started victimizing people. Yeah. Because if I'm correct, I don't know if it was last year or the year before where there were a lot, and, and I'm not saying this to to start anything, but these are just facts and this is what the news was showing us. There was a lot of blacks attacking Chicano Raza, whether you're a lotero, a paletero, or whether you're selling Vendors. Food. Vendors. Yeah. Vendors. And they were just getting attacked. And I'll tell you what really bothered me. That there were people getting robbed. There were ladies getting punched. Their, 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 their source of income was being trashed. But all we do is have somebody on film. Somebody's recording. You know, sometimes, it, yeah, I'm believe me, I'm thankful that somebody's recording this. But sometimes I want to sock the guy who's recording and say, help. Right. You know, like just recently, um, I, I believe she's in jail now. And it, to me, it doesn't really matter what color you are. But I have to say, there was a, a black woman that was assaulting some vendors, even socked this lady in the head, was throwing over their chat or chata, spitting on their carne. I saw it. Okay. It, there was nobody there that could have at least, you know, told this lady, you need to stop. You know, you need to stop. Me, the way I am, 
uh, if I saw something like that, whether you're male or female, I'm going to stop you. Now, even though I would probably feel bad punching a woman, which I wouldn't, but somebody could have tackled her. Somebody could have grabbed her and just moved her out the way or, or stopped her or something. But yet we had just had people just recording. And, and believe me, I'm thankful for that. But we need more. Oh, yeah. I've seen it. I've, 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 one time I was on a bus and, and three blacks were beating up a Chicano. And I, nobody wanted to jump in. I told everybody on the bus. So I'll put on Mexicanos on the bus. I said, oh, you know, help the guy out. You know, it's tu primo. You know, nobody wanted to help the three blacks were beating up a Mexicano on the bus. So I had to jump in, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I took care of them and, you know, threw right. them out of the bus. And, you know, and I saved them, you know. Not too long ago, it said another, same thing happened. This was like a couple of years ago. I was at McDonald's. Some white guy walks into McDonald's. His, pay, his face was painted white. And he went in there and started beating up a Mexicano who was, who was sweeping the floors at McDonald's. You know, he started beating on him. And so I went over there and I chased him out of the building. But, I mean, the racism in this country is because of our school system. Our school system is not working. It's not socializing our people. And it's, it's not teaching our people uh, the philosophy of nonviolence. The schools are not teaching our kids the culture, uh, and, and they're not teaching our history. You know, they're not. They're not. The schools are not embracing our history, and so as a result of that, we get the multiple uh, personalities. And that blacks are going through the same thing. The blacks are going through. They're, they're going through multiple personalities too. They're going through schizophrenia. You know, some of our us are going through schizophrenia because there's no culture. There's no uh, one American culture that that teaches people to respect people. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And you said it earlier, you know, you have Raza killing Raza, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah it's, it's just bad. And, you know, I was on a podcast not too long ago where somebody asked me, were you ever in a gang? You know, uh, uh, were you ever a gang member? You know, what neighborhood are you from? And I answered shamefully. I said, you know, when I answered like this, I said, you know, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I acted like a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's the way I answered it, because there's a lot of shameful things that I did while I was out, out on the street. And a lot of it was against Raza, you know? So I'm not going to sit here and brag about it. You know, I never went to prison, thank God, you know? Maybe it's just because I just never got caught for all the stupid stuff that I was doing. You know, I went to juvenile hall, I went to county once, but that's nothing to brag about. But a lot of the stuff that I was doing was against our own people, you know? And... But I like what you said. I think we need to learn how to respect each other. We need to learn not only learn our culture, but respect each other, you know, first and foremost, you know, and uh, uh, protect each other. For an example, for from things like this, look, you said you saw this white guy walk in, and not just because he's white, I'm going to say this. I don't care what color you are. I don't care if it's Rasa beating up another dude like that. I'm going to do something, you know. And many times I told my family, hey, if I ever end up in jail, it, it's because, you know what, I beat somebody the hell up. You know, because they were disrespecting someone. If I would have, if I would have saw that lady trashing that place, I would have got off and warned her at least twice. Stop, stop, not tackle her. You know, somebody's got to do something. You know, if not, if nobody does nothing, if we don't lead by example to protect our own, so to support our own, ain't nobody gonna do nothing. Then it's true. But so the support, you know, the thing about backing up a rasa, you know, um, I, for example, one time I asked a professor from UCLA, a Chicago professor from UCLA, let me have let me teach one class in Chicago studies. I was already teaching Chicago studies at, at East LA College part time. Yeah. And I told him, let me have one class. I just so I can help my resume, so it can help me, you know, get, get established. Yes. Through. And he said no. I says by saying no, I told him you're not you're not you're not protecting me, you know. And that's what it is. Rasa, our own rasa is not protecting our own rasa. And that same goes for these brown cops. They go, you know, shoot rasa. They're not protecting us. You know, we need to protect each other. That's, man, that's a, that's a powerful point. It's very, very true because when I was on the streets and I was maybe in my 20s, the guys used to give me the hardest time was rasa police. But I, I remember coming down from San Pedro. I had a cop following me, just following me, following me. I finally get in my neighborhood. I park in front of my house and he pulls, pulls me over. Right when I park, turn on his lights. And I was just angry because I, I really wanted to say, what, what, what? So he walks up to me and he's like, I go, what did I do? My windows rolled down. He goes, you got 10 windows? I said, yeah. And he wrote me a ticket. And I was like, you, I don't want to use curse words in front of you, man. But I just, like, yeah, I was just pissed not, off. He's not protecting your rights. Y yes, exactly. So. I think some sometimes, I just want to say sometimes, I think some of the Rasa police are some of the fucking worst. Excuse me, 
hospital. Brainwashed. And then once again, multiple personalities. They want to be brown and they want to be white. You know, and who, and who else would they, what, what else do they want to be? You know, uh, they want to be a killer. You know, yeah. uh, they got multiple personalities, and, and we have to we have to deal with this question of the psychology. Where is it? The psychology of the Chicano at today? You know, where is our psychology? What's happening? And we have to be uh, make make sure that we can't let these kids not have culture, not have uh, a psychology, brown psychology, because if they don't have it, they lose it. Absolutely. We're going to go ahead and take a 10-minute break, and we'll be right back after 10 minutes, and we're going to pick up right where we left off, sir. So once again, everybody, call somebody, text somebody. You guys know the rest, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. It's about to get good, so you don't want to fool around. Come back. Yo, what's up? It's Bella. I'm here on Rodeon Radio with my boy Tony A. The Wizard. Stay tuned. Yo, it's Ray Monique on Rodeon Radio with Tony A. The motherfucking Wizard. Tune in and subscribe. What's going down, everybody? This is Big Rich G here at Rodeon Radio with Tony A. You guys got to check this out, man. Don't miss out. Tune in. It's your boy producer A here at Rotom Radio. It's your boy Tony A. Make sure y'all subscribe every Sunday, Wednesday, 7 p.m. with the dopest podcast popping in the motherfucking West Coast. Make sure y'all subscribe. Peace. Yeah, this is Pablito here at Rodium Radio. I'm here with Tony A, the wizard. Tune in. What's cracking? It's your boy Noel G in the house, a.k.a. Hector. You guys know what time it is right here with the Rodium Radio Show, hosted by your boy Tony A, the wizard. <laughs> Keep listening. We got something good for you. What's good, beautiful ladies? It's your boy, MC Magic. Tony A, the wizard. You already know. Rhodium Radio Show. Turn it up. Yo, what's up? Good with y'all. This your boy, Big Prodigy, from the legendary South Central Cartel. And I'm over here chilling with my homeboy, Tony A, the wizard, on the Rhodium Radio Show. Make sure y'all like share and subscribe to the page on youtube and by the way check out that interview with yours truly you dig west what's up guys this is my youtube you're watching royal radio with 28 the wizard hey what's up everybody this is little silent from botg the voice of the ghetto man Tune in every Sunday and Wednesday to Rodeon Radio. You already know, hosted by the legend himself, Tony A. The Wizard, man. Just don't miss out, man. That should be active out here. What's up, everyone? This is Antonio Palayo. I'm here at Rodeon Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Make sure to subscribe. Yo, what's up, everybody? L.A. Baseball Head here, also known as L.A.F.C. Soccer Head, chilling on Rodeon Radio with my homeboy, Tony A., the Wizard. What it do? DJ Joe Cooley. You chilling with me, DJ Tony A., the Wizard, and Rodeon Radio. You heard me? What up, everyone? This is Salita. Tune in to Rodeon Radio, hosted by Tony A., the Wizard. What up, what up? Susie Q in the motherfucking building. I'm here chilling with Tony A, the motherfucking wizard. Rhodium Radio, YouTube. You guys check it out. Subscribe. Thank it easy. Yo, this is Shady Boy right here with Tony A, the wizard on Rhodium Radio. What's poppin' with it, family? It's your boy, Jokes Loves Life. And you are now tuned in to Rhodium Radio with the one and only Tony A, the motherfucking wizard. That's right. Love life, y'all. This your boy, We Throw Trees, Rhodium Radio in the house, Tony A, the wizard, what's up? What's up, this is your boy, Panther, on Rhodium Radio, tune in with your boy, Tony A, the wizard, and make sure you hit that subscribe button, yeah, yeah. This is Murray Brumfield, aka Mexicali Slim, Familia Records, and you rolling with Rhodium Radio with Tony A. Yo, what up, it's your boy, DJ Kazel, we're right here live, Rhodium Radio with my boy, Tony A, the wizard, that's what's up, Ooh. What's up, you guys? It's your girl, Mariah Avila. I'm here on Rhodium Radio with Tony the Wizard. Please subscribe, like, and comment. Yo, it's cracking. It's your homeboy, Mr. Motherfucking Junebug. And you just tuned in to Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the motherfucking wizard. And don't forget, subscribe to the channel. 
you know. You will live Rasa, your homeboy Hypnotic, right here in Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure you subscribe, like, and do all that. Don't forget to comment. Much love. Yo, 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 this is Grincho Brown on Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the Wizard. Keeping this shit popping, all West Coast, all love. Shout out to my Rasa, you getting it. Hey, look, this is Chunks, the San Diego All Star. You are now tuned in to Rodium Radio right here with Tony A. The Wizard. Tap in. What's up? It's your girl Carolyn Rodriguez here at Rodium Radio. Make sure you tune in every Wednesday and Sunday to Tony A. The Wizard. What's up, y'all? This is DJ Tony G. You're listening to Rodium Radio with your homeboy, Tony A. The Wizard. Rodium Radio. Yo, what's cracking? It's two Max with Mexican descent, visionary shape shifters. Good Life Project Blowed, LA Underground Hip Hop. Get tuned in to Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard on Wednesdays and Sundays. LA Hip Hop will save the world. It's your boy Cap G. Subscribe to Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. The Wizard. Yes, sir. Yo, what's up, y'all? This is King T chilling on Rhodium Radio. Tune in, subscribe every Sunday and Wednesday. Fucking with my man Tony A. The Wizard. West up, this Lazy Dub, and you're tuned in to Rhodium Radio right here with Tony A. The Wizard on every Sunday and Wednesday, 7 p.m. Make sure you like and subscribe that. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm right here at Local Negro, Tony A, Rodium Radio. Tune in. Yo, yo, what's up? It's your boy Antio right here with Tony A, the Wizard on Rodium Radio. Make sure you like and subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday. What's up, everybody? It's your homegirl, Lovely, and I'm right here at Rodium Radio with my boy Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure you subscribe and check them out every Sunday and Wednesday. It's Nina Beretta with Rhodium Radio and Tony A. The Wizard. Tune in Sundays and Wednesdays. Like and subscribe. What's up, everybody? This is a Puppet Master chilling with El Triste. Follow and subscribe to Rhodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Rashidi Harper, director, executive producer from Hip Hop Uncovered. And I'm here at the Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. Stay tuned. Coming at you live through the Harbor area, you got MC Poncho, the number one Sancho. And you're checking out Rhodium Radio with my man, Tony A. the Wizard. Check it out. What's up? This is Ronan Gray. You're watching Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday and Sunday. What up, this is Mr. D over at Rhodium Radio with my homeboy Tony A. The Wizard. Make sure you subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday. What's up, y'all? This is Uncle Spliff, man, from Spliff D TV. Y'all need to tune in every Sunday and Wednesday to Rhodium Radio with my homie, Tony A. The Wizard. Yo, you're tapping in with the Steel City Hustlers. This is Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. The Wizard. Motherfucking legend, make sure you fucking like, subscribe, share, do all that shit. Yo, it's your boy Troublesome Man, TM Gang Live in full effect here at Rodeon Radio with my boy Tony A. The Wizard. You know what it is, boy. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Ernie G in the place to be. I'm chilling here at Rodeon Radio with my homeboy Tony A. The motherfucking wizard. Watch those locals forever. Yo, what's up, Ben? It's your boy Young Hype here at Rodin Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Make sure y'all subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday.
Welcome back, everyone, to Rodian Radio, episode 264. And we're not going to waste any time. We're going to go ahead and jump right back into it once again with David Sanchez, once again, the founder of the Brown Berets. So, sir, how are you enjoying yourself? Great. Great time. Awesome. Awesome. I'm glad you're here once again. You know what? Um, you had uh, shared with me earlier that at the age of 13, you had gotten jumped. You had gotten to the hospital, and it took possibly about six months to recover. Uh do you think something like that is what possibly helped spark or motivate you, encourage you to move into the, into the, uh, if you will, the idea of starting this whole movement of the Brown Berets? Of course. I, I think most, most of your uh, good leaders are, have become victims of, of something, victims of violence, victims of poverty, uh, victims of genocide, and, and victims of oppression uh, that we all suffer and so when it hits you hard, that's when you do something. Go out there, join the Brown Berets, go out there and do something for the community. Okay. Now, w w when uh, uh, I had asked you earlier, um, I believe it was off camera, around what year and what, what motivated you to actually start this, this movement? And how did you come up with the name Brown Berets? Well, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Okay. Uh, it's, 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 it was a matter of, uh, I had belonged to a number of small groups, uh, Young Citizens for Community Action, for example. Uh, and, uh, and then we ch I changed the name. A lot of people didn't like it, but I changed the name to Young Chicanos for Community Action. And people didn't like that. Half the group left because they didn't want to become Chicano Action. And so then I changed the name again to uh, Brown Braves. Why do you think they didn't like the, 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 the first name? Well, because there's a lot of Raza there. They've been brainwashed. You know, they, they, don't, they don't identify with the, the, our native culture. They don't identify with Chicano. And Chicano is, is the aboriginal name of, of La Raza. And uh, they just don't identify it with it. And it's funny, but a lot of good people left because they didn't want to become more of a Chicano organization. And then I changed it again to, to, to Brown Braves and... Uh, but what happened was, I say I had a coffee. When I was 19 years old, I started a coffee house called the Piranha. And uh, I mean, my, my dad's right had a business, and you know, my uncle had a. They both had cantinas. So it was a coffee shop you started. Yeah, I started a coffee shop at 19. Yeah. It, 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 the reason why I say that's crazy is because today coffee shops are like the thing. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> coffee wasn't that good, but we had a coffee shop. It was called the Piranha Coffee House. And uh, that's, you know, and then one at the coffee house, I just started wearing a, uh, no, somebody gave me a blue beret. Hmm. Okay. And, and I wore it for a couple of days and they go, well, this doesn't feel right, you know, so, you know, so I went downtown and I asked, I asked the, the general hat company downtown, I said, you got any brown ones? I want a, I want a brown beret. He sold me a brown beret for about four bucks. And so I was wearing it around, you know, and uh, at the time I was also had a part-time job at the school. And uh, one, some, of the, some of the kids were calling me, hey, Brown Bray. I said, yeah, you a Brown Bray? I said, yeah, I'm a Brown Bray. You know, so then I went back to the, so then I went, I went bought 12 Brown Brays and I took them to the coffee house and I started passing them out to the people. Wow. And, and about what year was this again? 1967. 1967. Wow. And I was born a, six, a year later I was born. Mm. So you've been at it since a long time. Oh, yeah. Long time. Well, it's, it's, it's a matter of... Uh, Commitment, and not just that, but it's also a science. Uh, a lot of people do not realize that that the brown braid science is ta has taken years to develop to even come to this point. Uh, it's very difficult to keep it going because you always have people who are always trying to destroy the organization. People get into fights, you get splits, uh, you know. And we're all right now. We're just one organization, the Brown Braid National Party. Okay, the, all the rest of them are not us, and they're not the original ones. We are the original. Brown Braves, the original Brown Braves National Party. Uh, and we're one group. We don't really believe in chapters because, you know, two times before we had chapters, and then before you know it, you have two or three chapters in the small towns, and then they jump on you like gangs, you know? Mm -hmm. And they will try to push you out, saying that they, they, it's them, but it's not them. You know, so so that's the problem. So that's why we just stick to just one, one group. We're just one big group around California. Yeah, yeah. Right now, I had so many things were going through my mind as you were speaking. So it's, it's a lot of times it's hard to to listen and think of what I want to say because you're saying so many things that sometimes I'm like, okay, you know what? I got to stick to one question because I got like four or five okay, questions. I know it's complicated. Yeah. So, so okay. 
he, he, here's the weird thing, and this is why I feel so connected to this, because like I said, growing up, I've always heard of the Brown Beret. I just didn't know what it was, who it was, or, you know, anything about it. But I always heard it. I, I always heard about it more that it was like a protection group. It like is. It protected raza. Rights. Protect rights. Right. So, so that's what all I knew. Where I heard that, I have no idea. But it's funny because in the 80s and 90s, if you were at Wheel Metal, if you were from this city, you were considered at Wheel Metal. If you were from the east side or from the west side, okay? And the color of a sureño was blue, okay? Everybody wore blue, blue bandanas, you know, blue sweaters, blue Ben Davis, blue Nike Cortez. It's crazy because I always wore or always had in my back pocket a brown bandana. I never really had the blue one. I had nothing against it. Uh, my favorite color is blue, but I always had a, a brown bandana. You know, and people always say, why? You say, because I'm brown. <laughs> well, of course, you know, but yeah, that, that was it. And it's, it's funny that you, I don't want to say funny, you know, in a weird way, but uh, for lack of better words, it's funny that you decided to go with the, with the brown when you were given a, I believe you said a-, a Somebody gave me a blue one, yeah. A blue one. I didn't like the blue one. Yeah, yeah. So, so okay, so this starts about, do people start joining this organization with you as far as like, okay, now it's the Brown Berets. You're wearing a brown beret. The people are like, hey, man, you know what? What is this? I want to join. Can I be a part of it? How do I get educated? Or did, did anybody ever approach you during that time like that? Back then or when? Yes. Yes, back well, then. Well, back back then it was it was a lot different because we were, we were just all out of high school. Okay. So all of our brothers and sisters were in the, all the high schools. Okay. And and half the brown berets were brown beret students. So it was very easy for us to do the school walkouts because half of our our organization was in the high schools, so that's how we walked out all the high schools in 1968. Wow, and now did any other type of organizations possibly try to come against you guys, maybe possibly thinking you guys were a gang? Not really. Uh, okay. okay. Some, you know, some small groups, but nothing nothing serious, you know. Okay. Okay, and I have to ask, you guys ever have it, because I know you were talking about the Pachuco movement, how they would jump zoot suitors. Did you guys ever have any white guys try to come after you guys? There were a lot of different cases that we've been, we got shot at a couple of times by different, by the whites. Uh, and I think though the, uh, but the Rasa, you know, they, they can go and guess you too. You know, it's like, they call that the, they call that the tiger, you know, like, um, like uh, in Mexico, you had so much conflict and so much Vorullo and so much infighting and outfighting and fighting all around the place, you know, the tiger, right? And we still live with that tiger in our community. And every time when the tiger gets out of hand in the community, I have to remind them yes. that we got rules, you know, to stop the voruyo, to stop the cheesement, to stop the disrespect. And so we hit right. people with rules, you know, and that's what the the, the, the the movement does. It brings rules. Even Pancho Villa had, had a rule committee. You know, if you got out of hand, you might get shot, you know. Uh, so you have to have rules in the barrio, and we, we promote our rules all the time. Did you guys ever have any other raza, maybe uh, neighborhoods? Like, who, who, who in the hell are you guys uh, type of deal? As far as, because you guys were an organization, you know, uh, protecting uh, Rasa rights. Did, did any of, of your own ever try to come against you as far as? Well, not not gang-wise. Okay, I mean, yeah, we, that's what I was Because we had members from all the gangs. Okay. You know, we had, uh, you know, we had a lot of, we would recruit, recruit from some of the gangs. We had we had the West Side Flats and, 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 and the East Side Flats, uh, Primera. And we also had Maravilla with us, you know, so uh, it helped It helped promote the movement. Okay. Wow. Okay. And w w what was it that kept you going with this? Because at any time, you know, just like anything, somebody could say, you know, I'm just getting tired of it. People are not listening or we're not growing or it's not going forward. Uh, w what kept it, what was it that could continue to keep you uh, motivated to continue the Brown Berets? It's, it's difficult. You know, we, we did break up for a little bit for a while there, but... Because uh, people were getting their education and 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 they're getting good jobs and stuff like that, but I think the thing is uh, to do movement is you have to do action, uh, and as long as you keep doing actions, people don't complain. But when you stop doing action, people complain, and so like right now, for example, we, we have a movement against the high uh, price of gasoline at the gas pump. We're fighting that right now. Let, let's let's talk a little bit about that because. Right now, gas prices are are all time high, and now for somebody who's possibly not into the the politics and doesn't really know what's going on, why do you think the gas prices are this high? Well, they're ripping us off. You know, it's 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 three people that are really stealing our money. It's the 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 oil companies, the gasoline companies, you know, Shell, Chevron, 
uh, the gassing companies, but also the gas stations themselves. The, they're the gas stations you know, themselves. They're, they're also ripping us off. And also the state of California with a high gasoline tax, they're also ripping us off. So we're getting ripped off by three gangs. No, you're absolutely right. I remember, like, like there could be a war in the Middle East for some reason. All of a sudden, gas prices go up. And I remember, like, I would stop and I was like, hey, bro, like, why did, why did your gas prices go up? I remember this guy goes, oh, the war over there started. And that was his, that was his best answer. And I go... So, because there was a war over there, you yeah, don't no, even know they're, where. They're making excuses. They just—they're always trying to make excuse anything. You know, the one of the, one of the refineries got blown up, or, or they had a, 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 they had an accident. They're an excuse, you know. And anyway, we're we're meeting this um, uh, this this Saturday. I would like to invite everybody uh, this this Saturday, uh, July 9th. This Saturday, July 9th, uh, we're having a protest at the Chevron gas station which is right across the street from Alvera Street. Okay. So it's 901 Alameda. Uh, and we're having a protest there at 10 o'clock this Saturday uh, to protest high gas prices. If we don't protest, it's going to go up to $9 a gallon. And that's the only thing that's going to stop this, this, this frenzy of, of them robbing us for money is that the people begin to protest at the gas stations. That's the only, that's the, only, that's the poor man's press. That's the only press we have. The only way we can we can stop this is by protesting at the gas stations. And by you protesting, who, who, who whose attention do you plan to get the, the the mayor from here, or like what can they do? Well, they don't care because they're 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 making money. See, you know the government people they make good money, you know, so they don't care. They they, they got the money. They don't care. They could they got the money. They, you know, they're, and they're getting the money from the taxes. They're getting the money from the gas taxes. You know, uh, the oil companies, they don't care. They're all rich. They're all them Arabs living high on a hog in, in, in Saudi Arabia. They don't care. They're rich, right? You know, so it's an attack. This is an attack against the poor people. Wow. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm glad you're bringing this up. You know what? And you've been a voice for so long. And, and I want to bring something up. And I want to ask you if you ever thought about this about yourself. There's been people throughout time that have been a voice for their people. Like, I'll give you, I'll just name a few. Like a guy like Malcolm X. Uh, Martin Luther King, uh, and even to uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, through his music, uh, like a Bob Marley, people thought he was starting to gain too much popularity, and many times that could be power. Okay, they were all killed. Have you ever thought, like, you know what? I'm a voice for our people. Maybe that could happen to me. Well, first of all, you know, I'm trained. You know, <laughs> trained in the barrio. You know. Uh, uh, Hardened, gladiator, and I'm the kind of guy that if you don't make trouble, you won't get trouble. If you don't hurt people, you won't get hurt, and that's why you have to be careful that you know that, that uh, you don't step on anybody's toes. Right, right. But you know, but you being a voice and awaken awakening people and educating them to somebody that that may be trouble. Well, of course, it is going to be some waves out there but uh you know i'm not i'm not worried about it okay now uh back to where the this uh the brown beret movement starts to starts to move forward uh, about at what point at what point do, do you think uh what was the most members that you've had that were brown okay Bray? we used to have five thousand members wow at one time uh but the problem was of those five thousand members only maybe two thousand were any good for anything you know, because there's a lot of people out there who just wear the brown beret, but they're not really brown berets. They just wear it, wear it like a costume, you know. Really, really. Uh, I'm trying to remember of that that beret, uh, I, I guess, organization from New York. What were they called? They used to wear a red one, if I'm Oh, correct. yeah, the Guardian. The Guardian, Guardian Angels. Guardian Angels. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, from what I heard of them... That they used to go on buses, they used to go on subway, they used to go on streets and protect people. Was the Brown Berets something like that? The Brown Berets is 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 a, is a uh, civil rights organization. It's a, okay. it's an emergency organization. It's a it's, a, it's an education uh, organization to to do mass education whenever there's a problem, uh, and to make people aware of the issue, what the what the issues are, to make people aware of the Chicano agenda. Because nobody's listening to what we got to say. We have a Chicano agenda, you know. Recently, I just wrote a letter to the Federal uh, Communications Commission, 
And I told them, hey, we're, we're 30% of the population in Southern California, and we're not getting 30% of the airwaves. According to the rules, we're supposed to get our, our fair share of the airwaves. And that's another argument that we're facing right now. What, what, what do you think? Like, I mean, I'm sure you know, but I have to ask you because I'm sure fans want to know. Why do you think we're not being heard? They don't want to hear us. Well, and, and why do you think that is? Because they're racist. Okay. Hey. Not just racist, but they don't want us to, to, to develop power. They don't want us to get our candidates elected, you know. Wow. You know, for example, uh, we have Danielle uh, Sandoval. She's running for office for city council in Wilmington. She's a good candidate, you know. But a lot of this, no, there's no, she's a Chicana candidate. But we don't have any Chicanos. We need more Chicanos from the community running for office. And you know what? Um, I'm thankful you said that because when I started this podcast, sir, and I'm being 100% honest with you, I didn't know if anybody was going to tune in. I had this YouTube channel maybe about a year prior before going live. We had about 238 subscribers. And I only shared that because I was filming a documentary and I was just loading up clips. So whenever somebody wanted to see it, I would send them the link. And that was pretty much it. We had this idea. Let's just go ahead and uh, um, start up a podcast, promote the documentary and go from there. Well, it started taking a on a life of its own. And I began to shine light on our people, you know, on Rasa. I started giving them a voice because I know there's a lot of Rasa out there that's very, very talented, whether they're actors, whether they're comedians, whether they're rappers, whether they're singers, whether they're dancers, whatever. I started shouting. And then it was our own people that would comment, who in the hell is that? These guys are a bunch of nobodies. And here's what I said. You know, at one, at one point, Snoop Dogg was a nobody. At one point, you know, these all these major uh, actors or, or uh, should I say rappers that you guys support were once all of nobodies. And you know how they became somebodies? By you supporting them. Now help me make our own people a somebody. You'll, you'll go line up for somebody else's concert, but when it comes to our own, you can care less. You can care less. So it's time for us to wake up and to support each other. So I've created this platform to shine light predominantly on all Rasa. Great. Okay? So I said that to say this, and I encourage people. Now we have the technology that we can go live, and we can talk about issues like this. We can give people like yourself, sir, a platform so that our voices can be heard. You know, uh, like right now, we have at least a 1,000 people watching. You know, back in the days, when could we have gotten this type of airtime? You know, we couldn't have, but now we do. But I just say we don't have enough. We need, we need to open up more platforms so that our voice can be heard, so that, uh, uh, if you will, movements like yourself can continue to go forward. Well, people need to support the Brown Brazers. We are the vanguard. We've always been the vanguard for social change. You know, it was the Brown Brazers that did the school walkouts. Uh, it was the Brown Brazers that did the Chicago moratoriums. Uh, it was our group that did Catalina Island. We occupied Catalina Island for 30 days. Uh, and 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 today we're doing the stopping the the high gas gasoline price. Uh, also, we did campaigns to stop the violence. So it's always been the brown brace, the only ones left. You know, we are the only ones left to, to do to do a civil rights for our community. Now, when you said the school walkouts, what was the purpose for the school walkouts? Well, because the schools were all you know even today they were all the curriculum was all white worldview. You know, it's all. All about trying to make our kids into white kids, just like back they used to have the Indian schools where they used to make the Indians, you know, cut their hair and make them wear suits. It's the same thing. These are not our, our schools are like Indian schools where they try to make the Chicanos into white folks, you know. And that's why they come out. A lot of kids come out all confused because they don't know what they are. You know, they want to be brown. They want to be brown. brown they want to be brown. They want to be white. And then they, they start developing the the uh, the multiple personalities, and the schizophrenia comes in. I want to share something with you, and I think you'll be able to understand because I think what you just said is very, very important, and it's possibly something that I went through when I was not only in ele elementary school, but also middle school. You had the popular Chicano kids that wouldn't consider themselves Chicano. Half of the time, they'll lie and say they were half white or half Italian or oh, half something yeah. else. Okay. Yeah, that problem. Yeah, and then you just had the regular Mexican kids, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, first generation, you know, Chicanos born here, parents from Mexico. I was one of those. I go to junior high and I, I see all these bunch of Chicanos, believe it or not, that try to act white. 
Yeah. And those those are the ones that would call people like me, believe it or not, wetback. Yeah. Okay. You're a wetback. And I'm like, I want to say to myself, bro, I saw your mom pick you up. She was a dark woman. You know, but you're over here running like you're white. They're popular all through middle school. They're popular all through high school. They're the jocks. Then they get out of high school. They're no longer popular. Now they want to join a Chicano gang. Now they're all about Viva La Raza. And I'm going to tell you this. I, I know how to forgive someone, but let me tell you something. You were the same guy that were calling me an effing wetback. F you and your family, go back to Mexico. But now you want to be a part of the neighborhood because you're no longer popular. Yeah. You know, now they have Viva Mexico, Chicano Power. And I'm like, bro, you know, you're the type of guy you could have wished your name was Clark. You know, but it's true. <laughs> It's true. But know. there's a problem in Mexico, too. Mexico has 35,000 people murdered every year, just like in the United States. Absolutely. The, 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 the problem of communications has been broken, and we need to do something about that. You know, sometimes I think, and I say I think not because I know, but just from looking, I think we have more raza here, more proud to be Chicano or Mexicano than the Mexicanos in Mexico do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and here's another problem. You get Mexicanos that come over here, they want to be in this country, no problem. They learn a little bit of English, they start buying designer clothing. Now they think that, that not only are they more Mexican than you, but more American than you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I see that. You know, and I'm like, I see what that. the hell? Yeah, that's why they, they got to go Mexican-American or, or Chicano, because that's, that's our history. The history of Mexico and the history of the Southwest is our history. And we have rights, you know. According to the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, you know, there was a war, there was a big war between the United States and Mexico. Yes. And, and to stop the war, they made a treaty of peace. And that treaty of peace, that guaranteed Chicanos the right of passageway. They shouldn't be pulling us over for cruising. Uh, and they, they guaranteed us, Mexican-Americans, they gave the right of tradition. So we have the right of traditions, which is also cruising. We have rights, but they keep on trying to take our rights away. Yeah. You, you had mentioned you guys have occupied Catalina Island. Can you explain why that took place? Well, you know, we almost had the island. That could have been Chicano town right there. Uh, <laughs> but what happened was we got sabotaged by some fake brown braids on the mainland, mainly from Norwalk, some fake brown braids. But, well, well, I guess for the people's sake, why did you guys go there? Well, to take land, you know. Okay. It was the first attempt for Chicanos to take back land since since the Mexican-American War. Wow. And that's how the gringos came here. They took, they took the Southwest, California, Arizona, Texas, Wyoming, Colorado, they took the land just by come, just by squatting on it, you know? Yeah. And so we would say, well, we, we'll go take Catalina and go squat, out, squat over there and take the land back. And we were there for 30 days. Everything was going very well. But then a lot of the, uh, a lot of the agents, uh, you know, the, the infiltrators started making moves against us. Really? See, 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 that's what I'm talking about, being a voice, having a movement by going over there. That could be threatening to somebody and say, this guy is doing too much. <laughs> well, it, the thing is, the key is nonviolence, okay? Right. This, this is, Cesar uh, Chavez taught me about that. Cesar Chavez always organized very well, but he used nonviolence. Also, Martin Luther King talked about nonviolence. As long as you stick to nonviolence, you can do nonviolent maneuvers, you know? Right, but Martin Luther King stuck to nonviolence, and look what happened to him. I know that. I know that. But that's while well, they look where he went. He went into the he went into the the uh, the den of the devils. You know, that's you know you I, you know we're not we're not in the den of the devils. This is California. This is Raza. California's Raza. You know, it's all about Chicano. You know, you look at the state of California. In the state of California today, right now, there's five million Mexican American students in the state of California. That's power. Yes. You know. And we need to make that into a power. Why are we Chicano sleeping? Chicano power. Chicano power. What, what, why are we sleeping? Why are we? We're sleeping because there's nobody out there educating the people. There's nobody out there spreading unity except for the brown braids. There's nobody out there uh, uh, talking about unity. There's nobody out there talking about Chicano identity. And so that's why I think those, those issues are important. If somebody wanted to learn about those issues today... What would you recommend them to, to do? Is there any books? Is there any any channels? Is there anything where somebody can say, you know what? I've heard you. I feel that I wasn't raised with, that, with an identity. 
My parents came over here from Mexico when they came here. And I'm saying this because I've known people that have done this. Their parents came over and they wanted to be white. Yeah. Now, I know that they wanted a better life for their children. But coming over here and changing your identity, you know, and no longer wanting to talk Spanish, you know, um, no longer keeping your traditions or your, your culture. Now you want to branch out and live in American culture, which, you know, if some people want to do that, then that's fine. But I met a lot of people, friends, that their families came from Mexico and they no longer wanted them, they no longer spoke Spanish at home. They just wanted their kids to learn English. I understand that, that maybe they wanted, like I said, a better life for their kids, but at the same time, I believe that you were robbing your kid of their culture. Oh, yeah. Language is, language is very important. Yeah. So but I guess... Bilingual, being, to be bilingual is to be more qualified. Yeah. So, so now, for that kid that possibly possibly is watching and it feels like, you know what, I feel that I was robbed from my culture. Where can I learn from that? Like if somebody were to ask you. I think, I think Chicano Studies is, is the best. Taking classes in Chicano Studies. Uh, also looking for books. I wrote a book. It's, it's in all the libraries. I wrote one book called uh, Expedition Through Aslan. It's a history about the brown Braves. Expedition Through Aslan by David Sanchez. It's in all the libraries. So they can just check it out out of the libraries to see the history. There's a lot of history and it's technical history because many of our leaders, what we do is we train our leaders to become uh, experts, leader experts. And uh, that means we teach our people how to make speeches yes. uh, and we teach people how to organize and, you know, the people that do leave our organization, they become, they can become well off because they learn the skills from the Brown Berets. Mm. And so, for example, when the Brown Berets started Ultimate, a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the thing is to educate the Rasa, it's called Chicano education. Okay. You know, um, wow, you said a lot of great, good stuff. And again, my, my wheels are spinning and I'm just trying to see which one I'm, I'm going to ask first. But now, um, with everything that's been going on and our vendors being attacked, um, I know you you preach nonviolent. And um, I guess I'm asking a question for people that are, are, are looking at you as possibly a, a leader of this movement and saying, okay, you know, if, if I'm cruising down the street and I see one of our vendors being attacked, what should we do? Should we act out on violence? Because you're a nonviolent organization, what should we do? You can you can go out there and break them up. You know, you can you can break up uh, break them up and and let the uh, opposition know that that they're doing wrong. Okay. And if it's a and if it's a woman is being attacked, you can defend her. You know, uh, there's some there's some cases where you know you may have to uh, protect yourself. Right. And that, that's okay. You know, but as far as tactics, uh, for example, when we took over Catalina Island, that was a nonviolent maneuvers. There were, yeah. it, was, it, was a, it was a military tactic, but it was nonviolence. And so we can do more with nonviolence because, because if you do violence, the cops will go after you and they'll lock you up in a hot minute. Yes. You know, for example, uh, we tell people not to resist arrest because when they resist arrest, they get killed. Yes. You know, so we tell you guys, don't resist arrest, just go along with it so you can live another day, so you can fight another day. Yes. You know, but to fight with the police... They'll kill you. No, yeah, I they'll kill you. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and take a 10-minute break. We're going to come right back. I have some questions that I want to ask you about certain leaders, and I want you to give me your opinion on them. Okay. And if there's anything that I didn't ask you, anything you want to bring up, anything you want to promote, like the event on the protest on Saturday, right. we'll continue to talk about these things, sir. So, good. Okay, once again, everybody, call somebody, text somebody. It's just got really, really good. I'm about to hit them with some pretty good questions coming back. So, um once again, go warm up that food, get yourself a Modelo, and come right back. It's going to get a whole lot better. So thank you. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
Ed Doge. Yo, what's up? It's Anthony Campos, a.k.a. Big Citre. Inviting everybody to tune in and subscribe to Tony Vision, Rodeo Radio, with your host, Tony the Wizard. What's happening? It's your boy Bobby Castro, and I'm here at Rodium Radio with the homie Tony A. The Wizard. Make sure to like, subscribe, check out the shit. What's good, y'all? Eric Bobo from the mighty Cypress Hill, chilling right here on Rodium Radio with the homeboy Tony A. The Wizard. That's right. Hey, everybody, this is Cliff Ritchie, and I'm here on Rodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. What's cracking? It's your homie Crazy Boy, Blue Rain Music. You tune in to Rodium Radio with the homie Tony A. The Wizard. Tune in every Wednesday and Sunday right here. What's up, everybody? This is Dali C, the Trap Queen, and you guys are listening to Rodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Make sure you guys tune in. Yo, what's up? It's DJ Bobby B, and you're live with Tony A. The Wizard on Rodium Radio. 1212 coming to you live from the Harbor area. DJ Ralph Fan rocking beats with my man Tony A. Rocking the SP1200. Let's go. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Yeller coming straight out of Compton Rhodium Radio with my boy Tony A. The Wizard. Check him out. Hey, what's up? It's your girl, Miss Got this from NYC. Andamos aquí with Tony A. The Wizard at Rodium Radio. You already know how to bring the NYC love. Hey, shout out to all of you guys. Hey, what's cracking? It's that guilty one. You're tuned in to Rodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Live every Sunday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Like and subscribe. Ah. What's going on? It's Hazard. You are tuned in with Tony A. The Wizard on Rodium Radio. Make sure you tune in every Sunday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Yo, yo, this is your boy Invincible, and you are watching the Rhodium Radio Show with Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure you're tuned in and watching. Ooh, ah. What's up, guys? This is Isabella Soul, and you're tuning in with Tony A, the Wizard on Rhodium Radio. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Peace. What's up, guys? It's your girl, J Rocks. I'm here on Rhodium Radio with your host, Tony A, the Wizard. I'll make sure to tune in on Sundays and Wednesdays, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Yo, what's up? This is Jose Homicide. You hanging out at Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. The Wizard. Like and subscribe.
Welcome back, everyone, to Rodian Radio, episode 264. And we're going to go ahead and jump right back into it with, once again, David Sanchez. David, how are you? Very good. I'm glad you're here once again. Uh, I want to jump right into it and talk about, uh, you have three books that you've written. Yes. And um, first, let's talk about the first one. What year was it that it was released? And what was the, the title of the book? Okay, the first book was released in... 1978, and that's called Expedition Through Aslan. Okay. And that's the history of the Chicago movement. It was written, a book that was written during the movement, the only book that was written during the movement. Uh, the second book is called uh, Social Communication for, for, for Everyone. Uh, I used to teach a speech uh, class over at uh, Southwestern College. Okay. Uh, and uh, Los Angeles Southwestern College, I used to teach speech. So I wrote a book on communication because I felt that it was important for Chicanos and La Raza and Mexican Americans to learn how to communicate better because a lot, that's one of our biggest problems because our schools don't teach us how to communicate. Uh, and, and I just have written recently, I have another book coming out. Maybe it'll be out in about two months. And that book is called Chicano uh, Universe, Chicano Universe Advanced Intelligence. And that's about as high as you can go in relationship to understand the, the Chicano paradigm and in relationship to our intelligence. Okay, now let's go back to the first one. You said 1978, if I'm right, correct? Right. Okay, and um, what, what motivated you to write a book? Is it maybe because maybe you felt maybe your voice wouldn't be heard or just to educate our people of the movement at that time? Well, I, we were on an expedition. It's called the Expedition Through Aslan. Brown Braves were on the road for a year and a half. I mean, we just about got chased out of L.A. by the LAPD. They just chased us out of town just about. So we went on a, we went on a caravan, uh, 30 of us, brown braids. We were on a caravan. We went from town to town organizing different issues, organizing walkouts all over the country. We went to uh, a, g- g- a, a, give us an example of what, where did you guys go? Well, we went to 80 different barrios, you know. Uh, for example, uh, we went to El Paso uh, to protest against the uh, immigration uh, raids and the immigration shooting people on the border. Uh, and we were able to stop uh, the uh, stop the migra from shooting people on the border, uh, and we were able to get the director of the immigration to implement a psychological test to the border patrol, uh, so that they do not shoot people at the border. So we so that's one of the reasons why they don't shoot people at the border no more like before, because the brown boys put a stop to it. Wow. Uh, so we did a lot of things on the uh, the, the uh, caravan. The, it's called La Caravana de la Reconquista. La Caravana de la Reconquista. We finally culminated on Catalina Island. We had like 30 guys on the road. Uh, it's like a mobile unit. Trained soldados, you know, trained leaders, you know, uh, people that knew how to march, people that knew discipline, people that knew how to speak, people that were wi- wi- highly trained, brown boys. Uh, and so we went to go over to Catalina. We went over to take, try to take Catalina Island, and we almost had it. Uh, and so we held Catalina Island for thirty days. Wow! So, so the first, so the first book was pretty much about the whole movement, right? And uh, you had mentioned something that you guys almost got ran out by the LAPD, if I'm correct. You said, right. what, what, and why was that? Is it because you guys were growing in numbers? Is it because you guys became a threat, or? Well, it's because, uh, you know, the Brown Braves, we organized the Chicago Moratoriums. Uh, we were the first to organize mass rallies. Uh, the first rally we had, like, uh, 2,000 people. That was uh, December uh, 20th, uh, 1969. And then the second one, um, February uh, 1970, 1970, we had one big one, and it was 5,000 people. And then August the 29th, 1970, that's when Ruben Salazar got killed. Uh, that was a big one. That was a big, big, uh, it was a war zone. Uh, Ruben Salazar got killed and also two brown braids got killed in that riot. Wow. Wow. And that was August, August the 29th, 1970. So, so the police just started seeing that, like, this is just too much now? You get these guys out of here pretty right. much? Right. They, they went after us. We had 24-hour surveillance. They couldn't go nowhere. They were pulling us over all the time. Uh you know, they, they took me to jail a couple of times, and uh, but they they didn't have anything on me. They had to let me go. But I think altogether, I served about uh, for fake charges. I served about six months on different charges, uh, uh, violate, uh, you know, because I was doing civil rights protest. What what were some of those fake charges that they were trying to get you on? Well, the school walkouts. They tried to get us on conspiracy to disrupt the schools. Mm. Uh, there was in a grand jury indictment, uh, 
and they wanted to give us 64 years apiece for walking out to schools. Okay, see, that's what I was about to ask you. What were you guys facing if you guys would have been convicted? 64 years. 64 years. For walking out to schools, yeah. Yeah. And you probably would have gotten less for murder. <laughs> you know, because, we're, you know, you have to understand that's what, you know, genocide. And even today there's genocide in the courts. Uh, and even today, uh, Chicanos, Mexican Americans, Raza are being railroaded into the prisons. Uh, and uh, and it's all happening because we don't have a power base. We don't have empowerment. And that's why we have the brown brace to protect us, uh, to, to protect our rights in the courts and to protect our rights in the streets. Right. Okay. Now, so now, uh, how 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 well? Did, what was the feedback that you were getting from that book? That you know, were people uh, coming up to you and like, "Hey, man, I read your book." We're talking about the first book still. Uh, um, uh, how was it received? It was received fairly well, but the problem is, like in Chicago Studies departments, a lot of those professors they they never they never lived in the body or they don't have the Chicano experience. Uh, so they don't they're not interested in, in, in the Chicano movement. When the Chicano movement is Chicano studies. You know, and what we have there is, you know, uh, you know, the blind leading the blind. If you don't know Chicago studies, it's like the blind leading the blind. You know, and you have some professors out there, they're like the blind leading the blind. They do not want to teach about the brown race. They do not want to teach about the expedition through Aslan. Uh, they do not want to teach about the issues and the Chicano agenda and how we can gain power, how we can gain empowerment. They don't want to teach that, but they need to teach that. We're trying to get them to teach that. Yes, okay. So, um... You released that the first book in 1978. Then you released the second one while you're teaching, if I'm correct. Yeah. Okay. How how was that received? That was received pretty well, but I used it for my, for my classrooms. Uh, okay. And and um, primarily it was, it was I still I still sell those books. Uh, all of the books I still sell. Social communication uh, for everyone. That's to to teach Chicanos how to talk more intelligently, how to dialogue, you know, how to discuss things, you know, at a higher level, at any more. Uh, academic level, uh, and to, to, to teach Chicanos how to begin to understand themselves. Uh, that's, that, that, that's that book, the Social Communication for Everyone. But that led to another book, which I recently did, uh, which I took it a step further. I took from communication, I went to higher communication and advanced communication. I got this new book coming out called Social Communication. Uh, this new book's coming out. It's called Chicano Universe Advanced Intelligence. Okay. And, and, and where can... People, well, well, when that book comes out, where can people re, uh, buy that book at? Uh, uh, online, Amazon, or? Well, I think the, you know, it's going to, it's going to, uh, all the books are on, on Amazon. Okay. okay. Uh, but I think you can find, uh, uh, the new book will be out, will be out pretty soon. But if you can f look for my, uh, my uh, Facebook, it's David, under David Sanchez, I'm there wearing a, wearing a suit and a tie and, and a brown face and they can, Find me there, uh, through there by requesting uh, an addition. Okay, I still look need for to David find Sanchez, you. Uh, look for David Sanchez on Facebook. Okay, because I tried looking uh, on on, uh, on Facebook and so many David Sanchez. I know. Me. So, okay. But uh, um, now I want to ask you about certain leaders because I've had, uh, once again, actors, rappers, comedians. You know, uh, I interviewed the first uh, Latina mayor of the city of Downey here. Um, so I've had authors um so i've had many people in the different parts of the industry come here sometimes they'll bring up specific leaders and, and i'll tell you who it is and i hear good things about some of these leaders and then i hear very bad things about these leaders and i wanted to ask you because you brought him up you said you learned something from cesar chavez right. there are people that have come here and have spoke very highly of him. And then there are people that have come here and said, you know what, I don't want to touch that because I don't like what he did. I don't like this. And I heard very negative things and some things they told me off air or whatnot. So, but I've always thought it was always all good. Why would, would, why would people say negative things about him if he was for the people? Well, you have to understand that when he, the union wasn't his union. It was, it was an organization of... of uh, political support and political backers. And so there's some issues that he could not control. Uh, any leader in the community was, is going to get criticism. No matter what, no matter what you do, you're going to need, somebody, somebody's going to criticize you. Somebody's whining and crying on the sideline, you know, because they don't, they don't get involved, but they, they sure can criticize people. So we shouldn't worry about the critics. Okay. Okay. Um, 
For an example, there was this one guy that uh, came here, and he said some really nasty things about him, and uh, he said he wanted to talk about it on air, and I didn't want to talk about it on air, because first of all, this man is no longer here with us, and I'm not going to smut it, smut his name, you know, because I asked this guy, well, where do you get this information from? And he said, well, I heard, that's what I heard. He had heard that because he's from Mexico. He, he had heard that he didn't like immigrants. And, and again, being so ignorant of his of the movement, I was like, well, I thought that's who he was defending. Well, the farm workers, the majority of the farm workers are immigrants. Yeah. I would say maybe 75% of the farm workers are immigrants. I, th- I think it was one particular case where, where the immigrants were coming in and getting the jobs uh, and, and breaking the strike. He had a strike, a grape strike, right? So the immigrants oh. were coming in, and so that's why he got mad at the immigrants because they were breaking the strike. And so that's why a lot of people don't, don't like, like him because he, he went against the immigrants cause, because there was a conflict. They were coming in, they worked for cheap, uh, they break the strike, and... Uh, and so he went, he went, he said some things against the green immigrants, but that's about all. It was just one, one particular okay, incident. Okay, okay. Now, let me just get this straight for the people, because I was a union worker for 15 years, okay, Local 572 for the Teamsters. And for modern day, I, I want to make it, I make it uh, relevant. So he calls the strike. They walk out. They bring in some immigrants. To break work, the strike. To yeah. break the strike to work for cheap. So he pretty much just said, you know, he does, he's not for that. He went against them, if you will. Yeah. Okay, and my job, uh, since we're a union for uh, the market Ralph's, I work for Kroger, and the market that we would send all the groceries to was for Ralph's, okay? Our union re- uh, respected the union that represented Albertsons, the market. Albertsons was having a strike. What happened was our union asked us to walk out and to honor the, uh, this union strike just walk out you know until they get their contract so we did that of course our supervisors were trying to discourage us from doing so they were trying to discourage us don't listen to your union in other words break the strike so for people that have union jobs here's how you understand it better we walked out and what they brought in was people off the street that work cheaper and if you're a union worker, you called pe- those people scabs. That's right. what they were, yeah. scabs. And uh, they were there working, doing our job. Yeah, for cheap. For cheap, you know. So I understand now why people were saying, oh, he didn't like immigrants. I guess if you don't understand or know the whole story, it's better if you just, you well, know. We're, we're constantly being sabotaged, you know, by our own rasa. I mean, at all, at all levels, you know. Uh, I, I worked, you know, for the colleges uh, for many years. I worked in government. I was a, 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 a supervisor's deputy for the county supervisor here in Los Angeles. Uh, and I worked for the health department. Uh, and wherever I worked, there's racism, rapid racism against the Raza, rapid, rapid racism against Chicanos. They don't like us They because they, 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 they want our jobs. That's what it comes down to. They want our power. They want our money. And s- same thing with the gas stations. They want our money. Well. Wow. Here's another one that I believe he's from uh, Argentina. I, I, um, he was in Cuba, and he, I guess he passed away in Bolivia. And there's a lot of people that look up to him, and there's a lot of people that look down on him, and it's uh, Che. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, why do you think, I'm not going to say all, but why do you think certain raza look up to this, look up to this guy? Because I see a lot of raza guys with a lot, his Che shirts. Right. There's people that say good things and bad things. Can you shed a little bit of light why they would say either or? Well, it's because, you know, you have to remember Chad carried the Red Star, you know. The Red Star was from Russia, you know. And the problem is Cuba has always aligned themselves with Russia. And look what Russia is doing right now. So Russia has, has always launched a Cold War against the United States. Yes. You know, so that's why a lot of people don't like Chad, because he was with Russia. Uh, and, and then a lot of people like him because, he, you know, he had... You know, he had the will to struggle. He, he was not afraid to die, and he did die. Okay. Okay, I guess, is that a good reason for Rasa to be looking at him somewhat as a leader, or? I don't think he's a leader. I think it's just a come more, uh, it's been advertised so much over the years. It's more like a like an icon, you know. Uh, I think the other problem is, you know, uh, people, some people, they, they want socialism, they want the United States to be like Russia, but 
it's not going to happen. You no. Know? And so that that's you know so so they they cause a, a I call it buffer buffer movements, you know uh, buffer movements stop the Chicano movement. When you get Chicanos to believe in something other than the Chicano agenda, uh, the Chicano agenda is a survival agenda. The Chicano agenda is to create power for La Raza. The Chicano agenda is for self determination. But all these other movements, you know, they they try to make us do this and do that and support the you know the the women's liberation movement. They want us to support other movements, and they're just they're just tearing down our movement by by do, causing distraction. You know, uh, I'm I'm gonna ask a question. By the way, the the Cesar Chavez and the chair question, questions were were people that submitted questions, so I read off their question. Uh, the other question was this, and uh, somebody asked me this question. You know, since the beginning of time, we've had white presidents. Okay. In our lifetime, we finally had one black president or a black president. When Barack Obama was, you know, um, voted to be a uh, United States president, there was a lot of black actors, older black actors, that were saying, I never thought I would have seen it in my lifetime. That's what they were saying. I probably th I thought the same thing, you know, that there would never be a black president. And everybody thought the same thing. Even my black friends, he's going to get assassinated. Well, he didn't. He survived eight years. Okay. So the question that this person asked me, Tony, do you think in your lifetime, which is me being 54 years old, do you think we'll ever see a Mexican American president? And I just said, you know what? I don't know, but let me ask, you know, David Sanchez. Well, it's providing, you know, providing that we politicize the people. The people are not politicized. Everybody's talking about, oh, the browning of America, we got the numbers, we got the numbers, but they don't vote. And they don't vote because they're not politicized, and they're not politicized because there's nobody out there other than the Brown Brain National Party who's out there trying to politicize the people. But there's nobody out there educating the people on the importance of the vote. Oh, man. But don't give up hope. You know, there's, there's still hope. You know, hopefully uh, we start getting, getting a couple of Chicanos elected to office, and, and then we have a good beginning. You know, and, and, and see, now let me, share this, let me share this with you. Whenever... I'm not big on politics. I really am not. I'll, I'll be, you know, I've, I've studied a lot of ancient history is what I did. I probably know more about Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome and Israel than I do know probably about my own culture. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. But whenever I try to do talk about peop that people, did you, like, who did you vote for? Who did you vote? Here's what people say. Mostly Raza, and I know they're listening because a lot of them tell me the same thing, whether it's by email, whether it's by inbox on Facebook or DM on Instagram. Here's what they say. Well, why should I vote? My vote doesn't even matter anyways. That is the number one answer. They already know who they're going to put in office. Those guys are puppets. My vote means nothing. What do you say to people like that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's terrible. Uh, you know, they keep voting for dumb people. <laughs> and uh, because they got the money, see the people, they, the dumb people are the ones that run for office. They got the money, so they 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 do all the phone calls and all the postcards and all all the literature, and they convince people to vote for them. And that's why people are burnt out because there's no Chicanos running for office. If Chicanos were running for office, then they would have somebody to vote for. But right now, the way they see it, there's no nobody to vote for. We need more Chicanos to run for office. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, when, when Hillary and Trump were running for president, I, here's what I said. Wow, because everybody was saying, I don't want to vote for Trump. I don't want to vote for Hillary. I don't want to vote for Trump. He's racist. I don't want to vote for Hillary. She's evil. You know, okay, we got to vote for somebody. Okay. Right. My thing was this, like, I, I sat back and I looked at Hillary and then I looked at Trump and I was like, is this the best that we got? Nobody's running for office. No good people are running. I ran for office a couple of times, but it's hard to, to, to try to defeat the rich Republicans and try to defeat the, the rich Democrats, because a lot of the Democrats they're 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 uh, right wing, you know, right wing police, right wing schools, you know, right wing state of California, right wing prisons, right wing courts, you know. So everybody's stacked up against us, but we have to break the, we have to break the wall sooner or later. And, and, and you know what, David? This is what what I'm tired of. Okay. Say you you decide to run for office. Okay, and uh, um, 
you're running up against whoever, a, a guy named... Money, you're running up against you, big money. Yeah, running up against big money, a guy named John Clark, okay? You know what John Clark's going to end up doing? Going to look up, dissect your whole past. Um, are you sure you want David Sanchez to run for, as your president? You know, when he was once arrested by the LAPD for the Brown Berets gang. And it's almost like, like their campaign is just to smut your name up so that you don't win. Right. That's and I'm right. like, is that what we do to each other? But they've been doing it for years. It all comes down to communication. And that's why it's the wonderful thing that you have this podcast here. Uh, we need to educate the people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So once again, your books are on uh, Amazon. Or, or if they want to reach you directly, they can reach you on Facebook. David right. Sanchez. It's going to be hard, you guys, because I tried looking for them. But... You can search it. Look for the brown face with the suit and the tie. Yes. And then uh, you want to give us the number okay. if somebody wants to get a hold of you for a speaking engagement or whatnot. Okay. Uh, you can call Rosie. Rosie's the, our, our, our brown beret field organizer. This card says Chicano Movement Organization, but this is the brown beret national party. Her Rosie's number is 323-645-2052. Okay, then we're also going to put it on the description. Have we have we added that yet? Eight four five. Is it the Rosie number? Yeah. Okay, on the description. Once this video is posted, go on the description and it'll have her number with her name. Good. So people would know. So every time you guys see the video, go on the description. And all the info will be right there. Yeah, okay. I just I just like to remind this this new movement that we're doing against the gas issue. It's it's a start. Uh, because we're winning a lot of people on our side, uh, and th that's going to be uh, we're asking everybody come 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 down to Avera Street, ten o'clock uh, this Saturday, uh, July the 9th. Uh, we're going to be having a little protest at the Chevron gas station, which is just across Avera Street. I know exactly what that's uh, at. And and uh, it's and the address is nine o one Alameda Street. Uh, Los Angeles, California. If you're from LA, you know where Alvera Street is at, so don't act dumb. Just show up, okay? Because I will. Can I have the address again? You know exactly where Alvera Street is at. We need you to stand next to us because if we do not protest at the gas stations, the gas is going to go up to $9 per gallon. Think of that. It's a, they're attacking us, they're attacking okay. the poor people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And believe me, I might have to start driving a scooter soon. You know, <laughs> I still got my old pogo stick. But yeah, man, it's just that these pr gas prices are getting ridiculous. And, you know, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. You know, yeah. so um, other than that, we got a few more minutes. Um, David, is there anything that I didn't ask you? Anything you would care to bring up? You know, it, it's hard for me to question you on a lot of political stuff because I really don't. I really don't go into that field, you know. There's a lot well, of Well, you know, you can you can always invite me back another time in case you need a guest because there's just so much to discuss. Uh, yes. There's so much information. I mean, how how can I talk about, you know, uh, 50 years of participation in in, in half hour. So it's really important to know the history. The Chicano history is very important uh, to know, but also to know the Chicano movement history. You know, how we struggled for so many years, how we fought for so many years, uh, how People have sacrificed their lives. You know, for example, Ruben Salazar. You know, he gave. He was the only LA Times reporter we had that was telling our stories, and they killed him on August 29, 1970. But they didn't only kill him; they also killed two Brown Berets who also died, Lynn Ward, and and also Angel Diaz, who, who were uh, you know, Angel Diaz was shot in the back by the sheriff. So, so the thing is, that was that was a battle zone that took place, but it was because the sheriff were beating up and attacking the people. Uh, so the history to know the history is very important, uh, but also to know our culture. You know. Yeah, you, you, you. I heard, or I read somewhere that you had said that the struggle that was going on then in the seventies, you still see it today. The struggle still going on. Can, can you kind of share what you mean by the struggle, maybe just in a in a, in a broad sense? Well, what happened was uh, in 1992. The Chicago movement was t totally dead. Uh, even Chicano studies were starting to lose students because they weren't calling themselves Chicano anymore. Uh, so in 1992, uh, I did a campaign uh, to bring back uh, the movement, bring back the Chicano movement, bring back Brown Berets. 
uh, to unite the people. And ever since 1910, we've been working really hard to try to bring back the movement. Uh, our movement is a civil rights movement. Uh, our movement is an emergency movement because there are emergencies. Chicanos are dying out there every day. Uh, every single day, uh, the Chicano dies from overdose in Los Angeles County. Uh, every day, uh, Chicano dies from violence in Los Angeles County. And nobody does. So, so lives are at stake. You know, this is why we're involved, because we know that not only lives are at stake, but also our minds are at stake because they're trying to destroy our minds. The system is trying to destroy us mentally. Uh, the schools are trying to destroy us mentally. Uh, they're, they're, they're terrorizing our students by removing our, our identity. When you take somebody's identity away, it's like terrorism. They're terrorizing our students in the schools. You know, so that's why it's so important to, to, to make moves, to make action, to make movement. You know, and movement is very simple. You know, all you need is two people to make a movement. You know, all you need is uh, people to get involved and say, Yava hasta, we're not going to take this no more, and we're going to join this protest or that protest and back up our raza. And that's where it comes down to. We need to back up our gente. Absolutely, absolutely. Other than that, uh, um, David, I don't, I don't have anything else to ask you. Like I said, is there anybody um, you want to acknowledge, anybody you want to give a shout-out to, any, anybody, anything else you want to announce, promote? I think we're just about done. done. I think it mainly is, is we need to promote Chicano power. Absolutely. We need to, it's all about Chicano power. Absolutely. Uh, and we need to promote Chicano power and, and make people understand what that's about. We need power in order to survive. Absolutely. We need power in order to survive. Chicano power. Thank you, sir. I greatly appreciate your time. You sitting across from me, and I finally get to meet the man that I grew up uh, wondering who he was and what it was and what was this movement, and now you're sitting across from me. So this, in a sense, is so, somewhat of a dream come true, uh, speaking as a, as a child, always hearing of the Brown Berets. Thank you. Brown Beret so, National Party. Yes, absolutely. Okay, everybody, uh, let me go ahead and give a couple of shout-outs once again to uh, Alex Cervantes, Cervantes Enterprise. I want to give a shout-out to the Hip Hop Jedi, also to uh, uh, Norbert, once again, for helping us with this, helping us promote this, helping us be a part of this show. And to my son, B. Scallons, for helping me promote this as well, uh, for he helping me with the booking. So I just want to thank all Rasa out there. You know what? Um, um, I'm just thankful that we're able to provide you guys a platform where you guys could hear uh, voices like Dr. David Sanchez, you know, uh, where we're, we should no longer be asleep. We should be educating ourselves and we should be moving forward, you know where we should be proud to be able to say who we are because we know who we are. We know who are, what our identity is, you know, and we're Raza, we're Chicanos, so we're going to move forward. I just ask that we continue to educate ourselves. So uh, uh, if you get a, an opportunity, you know what? Order his books. I know they're probably not that expensive. You probably spend more money at Starbucks. So buying, buying a couple of his books ain't going to put a dent in your wallet, okay? What's putting a dent in your wallet is the gas prices, Okay, so get yourself one of his books. Cheat on your phone with one of his books and educate yourself. Become a better speaker and educate yourself. Why? Because knowledge is power. And with that, it's well, how we're going to move forward. And I end this with Chicano Power, Viva La Raza, and we're out of here.